This is Dr. Gooden with Personal, Social, and Moral Development. Um, here we see how it's connected to personal and social development, the development of the self, Erickson's psychosocial theory, moral development theories, and diversity in personal, social, and moral development. So factors that impact uh, development is just a few of them. Families, peers, uh, disabilities, culture, self-esteem, self-concept, society. So how do you see these impacting your students in and outside of the classroom? How would you deal with the impact of these um, as a teacher? You may want to think about each one, jot down a few notes of here's what I'll do with families. Um, you know, here, here's how I, I see this working and, and any role that you would play in, in helping uh, to make that happen or what your responsibilities would be at least. Um, in the development of the self, um, we talk about a sense of self uh, or identity. Identity. Um, uh, the, the student may ask, who am I? Um, one thing is counselors. I, I have a master's uh, in educational specialist degrees in uh, mental health counseling and and one thing we say as counselors is that you've, you've got to know who you are um, in order to be able to help someone else. I'd say the same is somewhat true um, as an instructor or trainer. You, you have to have uh, a sense of yourself in order to um, encourage uh, the identity development of the students um, as they ask questions like, what are my strengths and weaknesses? Am, Am I a good person? Do others like me? Am I worry of other people's care and respect? And, and what's my mission or my goal in life? What, what will my career be, perhaps? Um, so self-concept is, is largely a cognitive reaction towards the self. Um, knowledge and beliefs about oneself, uh, it's, it's not permanent um, or unified. So you can have a high self-concept in some areas of your life and other areas, lower self-concept. Um, but um, it, it is somewhat stable. It, is not, it doesn't change every day, um, of course. Um, so it, it can last quite, quite a long time. It may vary from one phase of life to another and from one area of life to another. Overall self-concept is made up of other more specific concepts. And it develops through constant self-evaluation in different situations. Okay. So self-esteem is one of the, the words that we hear often and it, this is our emotional reaction. Self-concept is cognitive reaction and self-esteem is an affective or emotional reaction. It's an evaluation of self-worth, and it's influenced by culture. Uh, students with higher self-esteem somewhat are, are somewhat more likely to be successful in school, and the school's role in student self-esteem is highly debated uh, whether we should teach that um, and, and how much we should um, try to influence this. Um, students are making attributions about their success um, or their failure, and we need to recognize whether, um, that these are important. Um, but, you know, there are some that say we, we coddle uh, students too much. Uh, we give everyone a trophy. Everybody gets a pony and a unicorn and a rainbow. And, and to some degree, um, we may be doing them a disservice. Um, but, um, within reason, uh, with respect, and uh, giving them the responsibility of, of taking an account for their own success or failure. Uh, we, we can be tactful, encouraging, motivating, um, while still holding them to a code of conduct um, of personal responsibility. Uh, we must attribute successes um, to a person's own actions, not luck or other outside forces in order to build self-esteem. The collective self is the idea of an ethnic identity, supporting students' collective self-development. 
um, the heritage language, uh, the language that perhaps you were born with, uh, your native language, um, and sense of self um, may be issues. Um, and there are bilingual education influences um, that um, we may look at with cooperative and uh, community projects um, in order to um, not only accept and tolerate, but to encourage uh, bilingual or multilingual uh, education possibilities. Um, Erickson uh, has a theory of psychosocial development um, and psychosocial means interaction between individuals emotional needs and the social environment. He says that we have uh, not just one but actually seven developmental crises um, and here they are. Um, so from birth to one year we, we struggle with uh, basic trust versus mistrust. Babies learn either to trust or to mistrust the others. Um, in their lives, like mother, father, um, that they will care for their basic needs, including nourishment, sucking, warmth, cleanliness, physical contact, uh, being held when they're crying. One to three years, they struggle with the ideas, um, this conflict of autonomy versus shame and doubt. Children learn either to be self-sufficient in many activities, uh, including uh, toileting, toilet training, feeding, walking and talking, or they begin to doubt their own abilities. Uh, from three to six years of age, um, Erickson proposed that we struggle with initiative versus guilt. Children want to undertake adult-like activities, uh, but sometimes overstep the limits set by parents and feel guilty. Uh, from seven to 11 years of old age, uh, we, we struggle with industry versus inferiority. Children um, learn to be competent during this period and productive. And if they don't, they begin to feel inferior and unable to do pretty much anything well. They're, they're really developing a sense of identity during this point, and especially during adolescence, the next stage, where they struggle with identity versus role confusion. They try to figure out who am I. They establish sexual, ethnic, career identities or are confused about what future roles they will play. I'd say a lot of us are making this, those decisions during young adulthood now, or what, um, what some have called emerging adulthood, which is sort of age 18 to 25. Um, a lot of our adolescent, well, growing up has been pushed back to those ages, 18 to 25 or even 28. Young adulthood um, involves intimacy versus isolation. Young adults seeking companionship and love with another person or becoming isolated from others. In adulthood, um, there's the conflict of generativity versus stagnation, um, the crisis, um, where we have to uh, uh, determine you know, consciously or, or just through effort and result. Uh, middle age adults are productive, performing meaningful work, raising a family, or, or become stagnant and inactive. And finally, uh, maturity. Uh, this is the integrity versus despair stage, where older adults try to make sense out of their lives, either seeing life as a meaningful whole, or despairing at goals they never reached and questions they never answered. Um, or bucket list items they never bucketed. Um, James Marsha came up with the identity types, um, saying that we have we may have identity diffusion, confusion about who we are and what we want. Identity for closure is acceptance of parental life choices without considering other options such as our own. A moratorium is identity crisis where we have a delay and commitment to personal and occupational choice. Delay of commitment uh, to personal and occupational choices. And then identity achievement um, is exploring realistic options. Um, in doing so, the individual has made choices and is committed to pursuing them. This is really what we're hoping for, but we can be in, in sort of any of these identity stages, so to speak. 
um, attachment theories uh, quite interesting um, and you can think of it sort of in terms of some of uh, Erickson's earlier stages basic trust versus mistrust autonomy shame and doubt and and how this affects later life intimacy versus isolation let's look at um, thoughts about self um, mixed with thoughts of the partner if they're both positive you feel secure and comfortable with your intimacy and autonomy if thoughts of the self are negative but thoughts of the partner are, are um, positive you're preoccupied with your relationships and may be dependent if thoughts of the self are positive and thoughts of the uh, partner are negative, you may be dismissive, more independent, and, and they may be dependent on you. You may dismiss intimacy, you may be strongly independent. Um, if both your thoughts of yourself and your partner are negative, you may be fearful, fearful of intimacy and socially avoidant. Um, a lot of this, um, they say, has, you know, uh, a lot to do with with our early years as a critical period of how we are uh, nurtured um, and whether we're held when we cry and whether we're fed when we're hungry so why do we need to be aware of cognitive and psychosocial levels as instructors trainers um, teachers um, <laughs> all right here's the reply a, a teacher received um, the following day after a student went went home uh, drawing this in class when I grow up I want to be like mommy uh, dear mrs. Jones I wish to clarify that I am not now nor have I ever been an exotic dancer I work at Home Depot and told my daughter how hectic it was last week before the blizzard hit I told her we sold out every single shovel we had and then I found one more in the back room and then several people were fighting over who would get it her picture doesn't show me dancing around a pole. It's supposed to depict me selling the last snow shovel we had at Home Depot. From now on, I will remember to check her homework more thoroughly before she turns it in. Sincerely, whatever this woman's real name was. So, we need to understand that students um, may not always portray things um, in ways that... Um, they would realize might cause concern, for instance. Um, limitations to Erickson's theory. It fails to consider the role of culture adequately. Most adolescents fail to successfully find their identity, as I started talking about. And experts criticize the idea that the identity crisis precedes the intimacy crisis. Um, in order to understand others and moral development, uh, we need a theory of mind which is basically perspective taking understanding that other people are also people with their own minds their own thoughts feelings beliefs desires and perceptions so in perspective taking we understand that others have different feelings than us and different experiences to build on than we do moral reasoning is the thinking process involved in judgments about questions of right and wrong and this has been studied as well um, distributive justice has to do with beliefs about how to divide materials and privileges fairly. Of course, liberals and conservatives would have different viewpoints on, on some of that. Um, moral realism um, is sort of the idea that rules are absolute, um, even if your um, family is starving, you should not steal bread. Um, Morality of cooperation says that people make rules and can change them. So Kohlberg uh, is probably the most famous person to study uh, moral reasoning. Um, his theory of moral reasoning, uh, he used moral dilemmas to evaluate um, levels of morality and reasoning levels. Moral reasoning was related to both cognitive and emotional development, he thought, and he found that people were in uh, three stages pre-conventional which is judgment based solely on your own needs and perceptions conventional expectations of society and law are taken into account you don't want to get in trouble and then post-conventional judgments are based on more abstract more personal principles of justice okay
So I wanted to put this slide in, uh, but I'm not going to go into detail on it. Uh, I really want you to focus on the three main stages of Kohlberg's um, levels. Sorry, the three main levels rather than the six stages. Um, so how did Kohlberg study this? Here's, here's one of his main stories that he used. Heinz apparently is a man, uh, not a ketchup bottle in this case. Heinz' wife was very ill. Unless she could get a certain medicine, she could die at any time. But this medicine was very expensive, and Heinz could not afford it. He went to the druggist, or as we call it, the pharmacist, um, anyway, and asked if he could have the medicine more cheaply, or even on credit. The druggist refused. What should he do? Should he let his wife die, or should he steal the drug? Think about how you would answer this question. If, it, if your husband were dying, if your wife was dying, um, if you had to steal a drug, assuming there are no other options, of course. So, he basically said, you know, to measure pre-conventional morality, if you let your wife die, you'll get in trouble. So we want to avoid that punishment. You shouldn't steal the drug because you'll get caught and sent to jail if you do. Uh, conventional morality says your family will think you're an inhuman husband if you don't. It isn't just the druggist who will think you're a criminal. Everyone else will too. So society will think you're a criminal. Post-conventional morality, if you let your wife die, it would be out of fear, not out of reasoning it out. So you'd lose respect for yourself if you're carried away by emotion and forget the long-range point of view. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that Kohlberg studied almost exclusively males. And we'll see soon that females answered this dilemma a little bit differently. Um, of course, it's not all males answer one way, all females the other. Um, but it does call into question whether we can actually measure morality this way. Um, morality may be developed through punishment avoidance, working with others, exchanging a favor, favors, pleasing others, being good, obeying rules, law and order, flexibility of rules, which involves a social agreement, and then a transcendence to more universal or even religious principles. Um, here's um, one, one study, uh, one study's finding of morality development. Um, and you see that levels 5 and 6 are, are the latest to develop, uh, where levels 3 and 4 are, stay pretty high um, and remain high um, after, say, uh, you know, 13, 14. Um, but the level 1 and 2 state, uh, stages of morality uh, tend to fall quite quickly um, within the first 13 years of life as abstract thought tends to uh, become available. Um, we make moral judgments, social conventions, and uh, personal choices. Social conventions are agreed upon rules and ways of doing things in a particular situation, um, like no gum because of conventions, but it is not inherently immoral to chew gum. Uh, moral versus conventional domain um, is taken uh, into account, and there are implications for teachers to establish a community of mutual respect, warmth with fair and consistent application of rules, um, doing as much as possible to have rules that um, are agreed upon by the, the entire community and pay respect to each individual. Uh, teachers' responses uh, need to be appropriate for the domain of the behavior, not overly punishing, um, for instance. Um, so there needs to be diversity in moral reasoning as well. Um, what is moral may not always be convention. 
we need to know the beliefs of the culture behind the student or the trainee. Uh, we need to think about cheating. Early research says um, cheating has more to do with specific situations than with general honesty or the dishonesty of the individual. Sometimes people get in a bad place and do a bad thing. Many will cheat if um, they have a lot of pressure on them to perform well. Um, if, if that pressure is great and chances of being caught are slim, chances of cheating increase. Um, students focusing on performance goals rather than on those mastery or learning goals as we've talked about. Students with low sense of academic self-efficacy are more likely to cheat. Males and lower achieving students are more likely to cheat. How might you avoid having your students cheat? Um, of course, there are a number of ways uh, besides walking around and watching them. Um, part of it's respect um, in building community in your class, um, fostering motivation, fostering that mastery orientation over performance orientation. Piaget's theory of moral development was two stages um, uh, for children's moral development heteronomous morality and autonomous morality, basically um, morality that's based on, um, well, that, that diverges versus finding your own morality. Um, and then an evaluation of Kohlberg's theory, um, his strengths, valuable insights into the nature and development of children's and adolescents moral reasoning and it's supported somewhat by research but is limited by a subjective scoring of on the moral dilemma test and underestimates young children's moral reasoning ability moral development seems to follow trends rather than progressing systematically through stages and there's some bias Goldberg's research was conducted mainly with middle-class American males under 17 years of age so Carol Gilligan um, was a female who followed Kohlberg, um, uh, didn't follow him around, hopefully, but did research after him challenging his work, um, saying he was gender biased, um, and brought up the idea of the ethic of care. Um, there were no significant differences in Gilligan's finding, both males, I mean, between males and females, both males and females can use either a care or a justice orientation. But brought up the idea that, that some of us um, may choose to save someone and still be considered moral. Um, and found that, you know, according to Kohlberg's theory, males would be considered more moral and females less moral. Um, but according to this um, sort of inclusion of a care orientation of moral development, f females were treated more equally. Um, and there's just as many males and females with a care versus a justice orientation. So in order to promote moral development, there are many moral education programs. Uh, there's character education in schools. Um, uh, instructional approaches, um, lots of values clarification, uh, and there's some question about whether we should teach morals in the education system, but um, we teach some cognitive moral education and then service learning. Um, and that has been educational psychology, uh, a foundational course uh, by me, Dr. Joel Good educational psychologist. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach me at joel.gooden at athens.edu. That's J-O-E-L dot G-O-O-D-I-N at A-T-H-E-N-S dot E-D-U. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.